A transformation has been taking place in the vineyards and wineries of Portugal during the last 20 years, bringing under of new wines onto the international markets. Indigenous grapes that were once obscure are now becoming mainstream. Tot as a country that produced mainly red wine, Portugal is now proving that it is a producer capable of making world-class white wines while tapping in its long history for winemaking. With my guest Richard Mason, author of The Wines of Portugal, we spotlighted where and how those changes are taking place. He has perfectly divided the country in four broad areas, Atlantic wines, the mountain wines, wines of the plain and wines of the islands. We explore those areas and what are the key changes that are taking place and what one should know about them. We also explore the Asian Sfino d'Italia and what are the categories Encruzado and Garafedia and much more. Before we start, I would like to shout out to fellow wine podcasters Shen and Jen of Potola Podcast, a conversation and fun wine podcast on the many different topics that are related to our favorite beverage. Hi, I'm Matthias Carpazza and this is the Looking Into Wine podcast. Wine and wine making can be complex, but this podcast has a simple mission. We want to give you the skills and tools to harness your passion about wine. Through this series, we will shine a spotlight on some of the different regions, process and concepts that shape the fascinating world of wine. I hope you enjoy the show and your own journey, Looking Into Wine. Welcome to the Looking Into Wine. I'm Matthias Carpazza. Today's guest is a writer, lecturer, consultant, writes for The Canter, The World of Fine Wines, is the author of seven books on Portugal. Among them is a free version of Porto and Duoro. Welcome to the podcast, Richard Mason. Thank you. Good to be here. Congratulations. You just released another book on uh, Portugal called uh, The Wines of Portugal. What was uh, the moment that you fell in love for Portuguese wines? Oh, that uh, goes back a long way. Um, I, my first job after I left school, between go, going to school and going to university, was in a uh, bar and restaurant in southern Portugal. And the owners put, put me in charge of the wine list. And I knew nothing about wine at all at the time. It was just keeping it, keeping it stock. I thought I had to learn something. So I went up to Lisbon to um, buy some books on wine and sat there on my afternoons off, um, basically learning about wine. And then uh, when I started traveling around Portugal in, in that same year, I started visiting, visiting vineyards uh, and um, I got the bug. Definitely Portugal is your area of expertise and I'm so happy to have you here today. In this book, you you focused on the dry wines of Portugal, and uh, That's right. so reading through the book it shows that the dry wines in Portugal have grown in interest among the producers and the quality. Why is that? What changed? Well, the potential was always there, and um, Portugal was a frustrating place when I first got to know it as a child, and and later as a, as a young adult. Um, the, the, the climatically, Portugal is, is 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 tremendous. It's a small country but it has this enormous contrast within a small area. And so there's no greater contrast in, in a sense of, of styles of wine between Vinho Verde in the northwest of Portugal uh, and some of the big uh, big alcoholic wines you get in, in, in southern Portugal, or of course Port, which is not, not a remit of this, this interview, but you know it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a completely contrasting wine. And it's a reflection of the very diverse climate and um, terroir that Portugal has, um, including its soils and geology and so on, uh, and traditions. There was uh, one of the main points that I took away from the book, it was the fact that then Portugal, when it joined the EU, uh, the, the European Union, there's been a lot of uh, uh, investments done by the EU. How did they help and what, what, what did they do? It was also rewriting Portugal's wine law as well, because there was an awful lot of restrictive legislation dating back from before the 1974 revolution that really hadn't changed. And so Portugal was really in limbo from 1974 to 1986 when they joined the European Union. Um, and really quite suddenly, quite quickly in the sort of in the last three, four years of the 1980s, things began to change. And it wasn't just about money. Money came in a bit later. Uh, money didn't come straight away. It wasn't just the investment. But it was also about, re, re, about um, uh, um, just changing the very nature of Portuguese wine and, and, and freeing the um, producers to do what they wanted. 
Um, again, that didn't happen overnight, but but slowly and gradually, um, it, it's allowed a lot more initiatives to take place throughout the country, without some of the restrictive legislation that there used to be, um, that was sort of set in stone, but but was unnecessary. Okay, and uh, there was a lot of. Uh... Movement and before prior data, there was a lot of cooperative works so done. Uh... That's right. I was going to just give you an illustration of that. I mean, the Down region um, was was entirely controlled by the cooperatives until Portugal joined the European Union. The cooperatives had a monopoly on all winemaking in the Down region, and Down was being marketed as being Portugal's leading wine region, and yet the region was underperforming woefully because the cooperatives just weren't selective enough they weren't uh the, the, the wines were, were when i first joined the wine trade in, in 1984 um on graduating from university the wines from down were frankly a joke um and yet this was supposed to be portugal's best wine and it, and it, and it wasn't and it, it, but if you did some research further back there were there were examples of older wines older down wines from sort of pre the cooperative era so the cooperatives really got going in the 1940s sort of 40s 50s um, and that's when they were given a monopoly on the on the region's winemaking. Um, the, the old wines sh showed enormous potential, enormous great class, um, and 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 yet the region was underperforming. It was and, and so it was very frustrating really to see this for, for a long time. And a lot of heads had to be banged together, I think, um, in government and 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 through some of the sort of vested interests in the in the regions themselves. Um, to to open up the country and open up to up to up to more investment and open up to more initiative. Yeah, and now the Dao is one of the leading area for dry wines with the Turiga Nacional and its unique climate. Absolutely, and a fabulous terroir, fabulous climate climate there. It's in that wonderful well, transition zone, which you, you can sort of draw a, a curved line through Portugal, where you find this transition between from the Atlantic to continental climate. And Dao is right in the middle of it. Um, so it's it's influenced by the by, by the Atlantic, strongly influenced by the Atlantic. They, sometimes you get a, a washout of a vintage with uh, Atlantic rains and depressions coming in. Um, other years you get magnificent vintages there. Um, but but it's the, it's the, it's the, it's this this sort of transition zone where where I think that the magic comes from in Portugal. Really, um, having said that, I don't want to don't want to cast aspersions on the rest of Portugal because there's, there's some some great wines coming from the whole country now, including the Algarve, which a few years ago. Nobody thought was capable of anything. Talking of vintage, uh, the vintage there, and it was one of the, there was a whole page dedicated to how you explain the vintage variation is a big thing in Portugal. Why, why is that? Why? What? Well, uh, Portugal, people think, tend to think of Portugal as being a Mediterranean country because they go on holidays to the Algarve, but at no point does Portugal touch the Mediterranean. And nowhere apart from parts of the Algarve does it have a Mediterranean climate. The climate is, 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 is dominated by the Atlantic. And just as you, you get um, rain-bearing westerlies coming across, um, and we face them here in the, in, in the UK, you get the same thing happening in Portugal. And, and OK, yes, the summer period in Portugal is usually dry, uh, sometimes too dry. Um, but uh, the, there's, there's never an Atlantic depression very far away. Um, and you do get a huge variation in, 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 in vintages, either from um, very wet weather in springtime uh, which can affect flowering and yields consequently, or you get it through through um, rain falling during vintage itself. And, and it, it's unfortunate that vintage traditionally in the Dura Valley usually started on the, around about the 21st of, uh, 1st of September, around about the equinox. And that's exactly the time when the weather breaks for the first time and the autumn, first autumn depression comes in. So you get a huge variation from year to year. Fortunately, in recent years, there hasn't, there hasn't been a dreadful vintage in Portugal. I think the last really poor vintage in Portugal um, was probably 2002, it was not a poor vintage, and then there was a disastrous vintage in 90, going back further in 1993, um, which was a complete washout. So the Portugal hasn't had a disastrous vintage for years, just as Bordeaux hasn't either. Um, but but Portugal, Portugal, north of Portugal and Bordeaux have, have a very similar sort of climatic regime in a way, because they're both next to the Atlantic. And uh, I mean, uh, I remember when I traveled, uh, I mean, the Douro Valley was the first region I visited uh, as a wine traveling. And I remember going from the Vino Verde to the Douro Valley, there was the fog in the Vino Verde and you get through on the other side. It was incredible to see this different. It was only like, I don't know, my, I mean, meet, meters and area meters are there, but it's only few. And it's super interesting. It's extraordinary how the, how, how the change comes and, and, and in the summer months, I mean, the 
the, the Atlantic coast of Portugal can be sort of fog bound um, because you've got this cold sea uh, against the warm land. It's much the same as it is in, in, in Northern California. Um, you've got the same, 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 if you know San Francisco, you get these sort of fogs drifting in off, off, off the Pacific there. It's the same thing with, with Portugal. The sea isn't quite as cold there um, in the, the Atlantic, but it's the same contrast and it's the same thing. And that, that, that then diminishes very quickly as you go inland just as it happened from the sort of Bay Area of San Francisco. Okay, and how many, I mean, roughly, how many kilometers in land are we talking about? Because Portugal is not that big, so obviously there's a... It's a narrow country. Um, it's, it's, a, it's about 100 miles wide, that's all. Um, it, it's, not, it's not very far as you go across, but it's quite mountainous, particularly the north of Portugal is quite mountainous. So the mountains actually, actually um, really form the divide. Uh, and what divides the Vigna Verde region, which you mentioned from the Douro, is, is a mountain range called the Serra do Marão, which isn't terribly high, snow-capped in the winter, but it's, but it's, a, it's a significant barrier. And the uh, Douro re region is in the uh, rain shadow of the Serra do Marão, and it makes a huge difference, the rainfall. So whereas rainfall in parts of northern Portugal can be as much as 2,000 millimeters a year, by the time you get to the Douro Valley, and you're inland, but they're about sort of between 60, 70 miles or so inland, um, you've got rainfall going down to about 600 millimeters a year. By the time you get to the Spanish frontier, you're getting sort of almost a drought territory where you're getting about 400 millimeters of rainfall a year. That makes a huge difference on, on, on the, 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 the climate, the landscape, uh, what can and can't be grown there. Um, and, and, and of course, in, in, great, in terms of when it comes to uh, vines, it's, it's all about grape varieties and the style of wines they produce. Yeah, I mean, talking of grape variety, Portugal has vast array of grapes and uh, it's, uh, when while reading or searching for this, for many Portugal hasn't sort of gone through the Chardonnay or the Cabernet Sauvignon, uh, and they still focus a lot on the national grape varieties. Absolutely. There's a lot of pride in the national grape varieties there. A lot of sorting out has needed to be done. That's another thing that's come again with the EU. Um, when I first uh, got involved with Portuguese wines, most of the growers did, literally did not know what they had growing in their vineyards, and uh, there, there was so much. That most were interplanted. Um, they were really get, it was guesswork of what was growing in the vineyards, and there were an awful lot of varieties which were of not much worth. An awful lot of varieties have been planted for yield rather than for quality. The um, under the sort of under the instigation of the cooperatives in the back in the sort of fifties and sixties. So a big sort out has taken place, but. People have tried I think, great varieties like Chardonnay and Cabernet Sauvignon. Syrah has made a big impact on Portugal. Syrah is, mm -hmm. one of, is, 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 Syrah is, is planted throughout most of the country now, and it's surprising how important it is in Portugal now. But no, Portugal has focused on its better quality grapes. And, and, and it's grapes, grapes like Turiga Nacional, Turiga Franca, which is being reappraised and, and, and is now being held equally with Turiga Nacional as, as best grape varieties there. Um, th those, those grape varieties are so well adapted to places like the Douro, where you've got these arid drought conditions, unreliable rainfall, uh, and um, yet they're capable of producing great wines. And that's been proved for years in things like Vintage Port, um, now being proved in in in, uh, in table wines in, or dry wines as you call them. Oh, in the book, you there's all the, the in the book you give all the list of the grape varieties, which what, why in half an hour we can't possibly go through them. But I invite everybody to go and have a have a look at them because it's very detailed in each of them. But talking about this, um, the dry grape, the the fact that the Portuguese grapes are adapted to. The arid grapes. So, do you do you think they are going to be used anywhere else in the the world? Are you seeing any like influence from Portuguese grapes around the world? Well, it's interesting, isn't it, that the Bordeaux has recently adopted Turiga Nacional as 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 it's now permits Turiga Nacional for for uh, basic Bordeaux and Bordeaux Superior wines. Um, they're thinking of the future and, and what might be happening with uh, with climate change. Um, Alvarinho is another one that's now planted in Bordeaux. Alvarinho. It's debatable whether it's a, a Portuguese or a, or, a, or a Spanish grape variety, but it, it, it covers the two places in northwest Portugal. Um, so it's already happening, uh, and there's lots of experimentation going on in California with Portuguese grapes and, and Australia as well. So yes, is the answer that they, 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 you know they're there to conquer the world. Well, we, in, we were seeing a few years of where they grow, and we find a good example of uh, Turiga Nacional from anywhere in the world. It would be very interesting to follow. So in uh, talking about Alvarinho and Vigna Verde, well. I mean, it's a very interesting region. 
And uh, we, I mean, most of the people think that this region only produces white, but actually produce most of the region produce red wines. And uh, what what grape do they have, and why is called Vino Verde? Well, it, it's called Vino Verde uh, because it means green wine, and, and the the coast of that area is called the Costa Verde, the Green Coast, uh, and it describes very well what, what it is because it's it's fairly damp, humid, Atlantic climate, so it is very green the whole year round. But it, it's not because of that, actually. In, in, in fact, in, in traditionally, Portuguese wine lists used to divide um, between Vinhos Verdes, green wines, and Vinhos Maduros, which was mature wines. So you'd have um, the, the, the green wines were basically the, the young wines, the wines to be drunk straight away, if you like, uh, whereas the Vinhos Maduros were the wines that had been through cask and, and, and so on, were bottled and, and so on, and wines that were, were aging. That was, that was the sort of crude distinction that you would find on traditional Portuguese wine lists. And so Vinho Verde was, was the wine to drink young, basically. That's what it really means. It's the wine to be, to be drunk young. At one time, it was sort of thought as being a, a wine really just for just for knocking back, good with shellfish on the local local beaches and that sort, that sort of thing. It was, it, was, it was fizzy. It was a sort of pop wine, if you like. It had to be a lot more than that, partly because it has some great varieties, not just Alvarinho, but there's another one called Lureiro, which is, is, is very promising um, as well. And it's producing wines of real quality now. And wines, and Alvarini is capable of aging. Um, it's not a wine necessarily that needs to can be drunk sort of, you know, yesterday. It's a wine that you can be drunk, and the wine will develop over, over a few years. So I think probably the most exciting thing that's been going on recently in Portuguese wines in general is the overall improvement of, of white wines from the Vinho Verde right down into the Alentejo, where, where, where but particularly in those areas with the Atlantic influence um, or, uh, or, or areas with higher altitude, where grape varieties are sort of being discovered that, that, that are making wines that are age-worthy and are really interesting. And, and of course, the Atlantic climate helps um, for these, gra these grapes uh, to conserve their acidity. There's a variety which is called Arinto, which is grown throughout southern Portugal. It's also grown in, in, in the Vinish Verd under another name, less successfully there. But in, down in southern Portugal, where you've got a much hotter climate, uh, a more arid climate. Arinto hangs on to its acidity almost wherever you, wherever you plant it. Uh, and it's used for making varietal wines, but more often than not in, in blends uh, to just give acidity, to help give acidity to, 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 to natural acidity to, uh, to other blends. So there's a lot of um, interesting wines and interesting things being uncovered over the years. Um, uh, a lot, there's still a lot more to come. White wine from Portugal it would be something to look at. I mean, I knew about uh, Vinho Verde, but I haven't tried that many white wine, but definitely I'm going to have a look uh, to, to try some more of them. Have a look around. A trial, trial and error. I think the other region that, that, that is, is, is look, worth looking at now for white wines is uh, the Lisboa region, uh, the Lisbon region, just north of there. Again, you've got that Atlantic climate there, and uh, with the right grape varieties, um, some lovely wines are being made there now, white wines from there, very much influenced by the Atlantic. I remember reading in, in the book, it was very interesting, this uh, very close to the uh, ocean and this very quite up-and-coming up region in Portugal. Talking about up-and-coming, and you mentioned it earlier, there's one of the other regions, a part of uh, Dao, has been Ante, Anteleio. Sorry, my pronunciation. Oh, Alentejo. Alentejo, sorry. Alentejo, Alentejo, sorry. No, uh, my Portuguese is, is not good. <laughs> and um, how does, uh, how did that become uh, the one of the re leading area of uh, Portugal and what makes it special? I know you had a vineyard there at some point. The Alent the Alent I did have it in the north of Alentejo, yeah. The, the Alentejo is, is, is special in, the, in that it's, um, it's much flatter than the rest of Portugal. So, so when you get south of the Tagus, you get into this rolling, big rolling plain. And historically, the Alentejo had much larger land holdings, much larger units of land, whereas the north of Portugal is very fragmented. Uh, it means the... Um, Agriculture was quite inefficient there, and quite, uh, and, and one of the reasons why the cooperatives came to dominate there was the fact that it was trying. They were trying to bring these small small producers together. In the Alentejo, it's the opposite. There was the, it was the case. You got these huge estates down, down there, and it made it very um, easy to plant and to mechanize, particularly. Whereas the north of Portugal is very difficult to mechanize. You, you've been to the Dura, you know how difficult those terrace vineyards are up there. Well. 
it's like that all around all around the north north of Portugal, um, and you've got and, sm and small holdings don't help either to mechanise. Um, so the Alentejo, you've got you could you could find vineyards with a, with extending to sort of hundreds of hectares, whereas a lot of the vineyards in the north of Portugal extend to a fraction of a hectare. Um, that's that's the difference. And also, the Alentejo was the first to really rewrite the rule book. The, the region was it was actively discouraged before the revolution for, for to plant. Um, Grapes, plant vines in the in the Alentejo, and when the after the revolution, when things settled down, um, the region wrote its own rules again, and it was the first place to bring in Syrah, for example. It was the first first places to bring in. It, it allowed a lot more flexibility. As a result, I think it captured people's imaginations, and these these suddenly these 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 lovely, big sort of ripe, fleshy red wines were coming out of the Alentejo, which were quite um, user friendly in the sense that they were. Easier to e e much easier on export markets. Well, traditionally the wine, red wines from northern Portugal, were sort of quite hard and tannic. These were much softer, easier fruit-driven wines, and that's I think what captured people's imagination. But the Alentejo is a huge area. It's about a third of Portugal in total, um, and it goes all the way from the the coast between Lisbon and the Algarve, all the way inland to Spain, and right up to the, T the Tagus River. Um, my vineyard was right in the very north of the Alentejo, where you've actually got some mountains there, and I, where, where I chose that area because you, because it's that little bit cooler. I mean, Alentejo gets some pretty extreme heat, and uh, you really can't do much without irrigation there in these these these, these vineyards. We were we were doing dry farm vi vineyards up in the north of the Alentejo because we we had we had the rainfall, we had the springs, we had the it was we had the the, the right terroir and and um, and climate up there to be able to do that. So the Alentejo is it's difficult to generalize without the Alentejo because it, it's a big area producing lots of different styles of wine. And one of them is uh, the, called the Vino de Italia. Ta Taya? Yes, that's a revival of an old tradition. So well, what is it? And uh, I, was, I discovered it through the book. I never, I never come across it before. Italias uh, are the way the wines are traditionally made in the Alentejo. They're big clay pots. Um, uh, I can't tell you exactly what the capacity of them is. They vary, of course. Uh, they were, they were, they were sort of rough, and it's where the, where the wines were made privately in these big, huge clay pots and stored in there. And Vigna d'Italia has now become a, uh, it's now been written to the legislation so that producers now can make wine uh, in the traditional way in these, in these clay pots, uh, Italia wine. The, 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 the producer that kept it going for all these years was a, a producer with a long name, um, shortened now to José de Souza in Regangues de Montserrage. And it belongs to José Maria de Fonseca, a big, big producer. And they, they kept it going and restored the tradition, really. And, and it's a, there's, a, there's a spectacular adega there, winery there, where there must be, I don't know how many pots there are in there, but there's, there's sort of uh, uh, 50 or 60 of these great clay pots all being used for fermenting wines. Quite labor intensive. The wines will never be cheap. Yeah, uh, and, and seems to lend itself to the Alentejo's ripe fruit. Okay, I mean, I can see, I can see a market for for this sort of wine, and especially in England, I can see people being interested in these wines. And for me, it's very interesting talking. I mean, obviously, we haven't talked about the Douro Valley because I think that they have a different uh, chat altogether, and it's a whole region by itself. But for me, it was very interesting to speak about dry wines of Portugal, and definitely something to grow. And I. Don't think I've seen in the book, but is there any like dry wine made in uh, Madeira, or is just? Yes, there is. The Azores and Madeira are becoming um, increasingly, increasingly interesting. There's quite a lot of interest, of course, in in in, in wines coming from volcanic soils, and both uh, the Azores or Azores and Madeira uh, are both volcanic. Um, the totally different traditions there, they, they, with different different climates. Madeira has a a basically a subtropical climate uh, but um it has altitude as well so uh, within a small area you, as you as you as you go up in altitude the vegetation changes and, and of course the grape varieties change as well and, and uh, i i care what i say about this because my, my wife's family are producers of um of madeira wine uh, and, and i adore their fortified wines this bland blandy i'm not such a fan of the um dry wines from Madeira as yet. Um, uh, they're, they're using Madeira's traditional grapes, um, including um, for reds, um, Tinta Negra, which I'm not convinced necessarily is the right grape uh, for, a red, for, for a red wine. 
Um, there may be well be a lot more to be said for something from Vidalio, um, which is a white, white grape variety, of course, makes amazing fortified wines that can that be some of the, the longest lived wines in the world and may well be capable. Um, it's certainly, it's certainly a Vidalia, whether it's the same Vidalia in Australia, is making making some great wines down there. Whether whether that comes in Madeira, I'm, I'm not sure yet. But, but I, I, I'm judgment. I reserve my judgment at the moment. <laughs> okay. Well, for me, it's interesting. I mean, I know Madeira is only a handful of producers, and it's interesting to see them start doing some dry wine there. And definitely, with all the Portugal, the, the interest is there to produce more dry wine. I mean, and just uh, I have the last couple of questions. There was this difference on the labeling called. Encruzado and Garafera? Well, okay. En Encruzado is a grape variety. Encruzado is a grape variety that, that's planted really in the Down region. And it's a variety that's become a, um, it's one of Portugal's leading white grape varieties. It's not the easiest white grape variety to grow, um, but it's it retains its acidity and, and it's a wine that actually gets, it, it, it has some some body as well and produces wines which are ca capable of oak aging so they get a bit, they take on a sort of burgundian quality to them so it's potentially one of all portugal's leading grape varieties which at the moment is only planted really in the down region um and so you see in cruzado wines now varietal wines coming out of that coming out of there garafera is totally different garafera is, is a category of wine which when i first um started out in the wine trade was much more common than it is today and the word garafera means private cellar um, in, in, in Portuguese, and it was a wine that was used by these big negociant companies, merchant firms, who were buying in wines, often from the cooperatives at one time, and they would reserve their best wines and bottle it under a Garafeira label. And so there were some great wines coming, coming there, but the frustrating thing with, with Garafeira in, in those days was you never knew where it was coming from. So there was no regional definition on it at all. It was a sort of Garafeira could come from the Ribatejo one year, or the Dura the next, depending on where the where the quality of the wine was. It was just is that, but 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 some of these wines were very long living and and really um, very very impressive. Uh, and and they were the, it was the best category of wine um, in Portugal b before the whole country got d d demarcated and so on in the way it is now. So you don't see Garofera now um, in the in the way it did, did then. It was it was like the, the sort of grand reserva, if you like, of Portugal in those days. Um, but there were no rules attached to it. It was just it was a wine that that was that was your Garofeira was your best wine. Okay, it was uh, it was that it was the producer name in deciding that was that it was the barrel or the, the selection. Okay, it was deciding selection. As I say, there was no, there wasn't necessarily a a, um, a region not attached to it at all. Okay, I mean, I just uh, I got the last question because. Um, I mean, if I was to sort of look to explore dry wines, I never tried dry wines from Portugal. And if I choose like free region or style, where would you start for like some Nissanas that want to start exploring? It's difficult. <laughs> where would you start? Um, it depends what style of wine you, you like. Um, Portugal has wines for everyone. Uh, and I think I, I love the Vigna Verde region. I, I, I love the Vigna. It's not just Alvarinha, but also Loredo. Um, other varieties there as well, and I love love these wines. I love the minerality of them. I know that's a word that's rather overused now, but I, I love that steely quality of them. And and particularly if you like wines that are lower in alcohol, you still find Vignes Verdes around around about sort of eleven, eleven point five alcohol, um, twelve. You know, these days when we now see wines going at sort of thirteen, fourteen, it's quite refreshing. And they always have this this high level of natural acidity. So that's somewhere I would go for a white wine, and I, I still I dream in these days of lockdown of being on a, a beach in northern Portugal with a glass of vinho verde and a plate of shellfish. Um, nothing better, no better combination. <laughs> this was a nice start. Um, I think if you're looking for the contrasting wines um, for red, I would go into the Douro um, because I think the Douro has the, the Douro has obviously proved its potential over the years with port wine. But with improvements in um, technique and technology and just knowledge generally of, of vineyards and grape varieties, there are some really expressive, um, potentially long-lived reds coming out of, of Douro with um, uh, the, um, the, 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 the reds that are being made there now. Um, so that's really at the opposite spectrum from, from Vigna Verde. If you're looking for really accessible wines, easy drinking wines, go to the south of Portugal, go to the, the Tejo region, which is um, has been underperforming, but it actually has some lovely wines there, and it's not not appreciated. And the Alentejo 
um, because there are some lovely, soft, easygoing, fleshy wines there, which don't require perhaps as much thought as the Duro wines do. Um, they're not as tannic, they're not as astringent, they're not as, uh, uh, but they're, they're, they're just easy to drink. And that's what's made them very popular restaurant wines in Portugal. Okay, I mean, it's all a treat throughout the Portugal, Porto region. I mean, thank you, uh, Richard. Uh, I want to thank you for this half an hour together. And uh, I mean, congratulations again on uh, your book, The, the Wines of Portugal. Uh, it's a brilliant book. And also all the other books on Portugal, Madeira and Duora. I got a couple of editions of your Duora and Port book. So I'm a pleasure to have you here today. It's been good to talk to you. I would like to thank today's guest, Richard Mason, author of the book, The Wines of Portugal, for his times and sharing his knowledge with us. Also remember to hit the follow button to the podcast and as always, please remember to leave a review. You can reach us on Instagram on mattia.lookingintowine and Mattias Capazza on all other social medias. If you're enjoying and would like to support the podcast, you can donate on mattiascarpazza.com. Music produced by Samuele Di Nardo, editing and mastering by Tommaso Ascoli. I have been fed, that's a fact. I have been fed, that's a fact. My credit card purchases get me cash back. My credit card purchases get me cash back. No one else gets these rewards. Sergeant, that is just plain untrue. What in tarnation? Sir, PenFed's PowerCash Rewards Card isn't just for military members. Anyone can get cash back on all purchases. Ah, friggins! You've ruined my favorite song. PenFed Credit Union. Visit penfed.org slash powercash. To receive any advertised product, you must become a member of PenFed, insured by NCUA. El nuevo Crispy Chicken Sandwich de McDonald's es... Crujiente, tiernito, wholesome. Es pollo en la McDonald's, un mordisco y... Wow. Es el nuevo Crispy Chicken Sandwich. Ordena por anticipado en el app de McDonald's. Ba -ba -ba -ba. En McDonald's Participantes.